हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू द एनालिस्ट फॉर फोर्थ ऑफ नवंबर 2023 आई होप योर प्रिपरेशन इज गोइंग वेल एंड लेट अस लुक एट द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट आर्टिकल्स ऑफ टुडेस बाय लुकिंग एट द टेबल ऑफ कंटेंट द वेरी फर्स्ट आर्टिकल इज अबाउट इलेक्ट्रल बॉन्ड्स इन इंडिया एंड द रिलेटेड कांसेप्ट ऑफ राइट टू इंफॉर्मेशन रिगार्डिंग इट नेक्स्ट वी विल बी लुकिंग एट द सीवियर लेवल्स ऑफ पोल्यूशन इन न्यू दिल्ली नेक्स्ट वी विल बी लुकिंग एट सम ऑफ द कंसर्न्स ऑफ द इंडियन फिल्म इंडस्ट्री रिगार्डिंग फिल्म पायरेसी इन इंडिया then we will be looking at the zika outbreak in bangalore and finally we will be wrapping up the session with the india services purchasing managers index report which came out recently before starting with the very first article i want to tell you that the handout for this discussion is in the description below so do definitely check it out now the very first article is regarding a wonderful piece of editorial written by sy kureshi who was uh, the chief election commissioner of india earlier and uh, he is generally talking on the amount of deliberations and discussions that is being taking place regarding the electoral bond in india and in this case the solicitor general of india recently argued that the citizens have no right to know regarding the donors and recipients identities regarding the electoral bonds in india now we in this discussion we will be trying to understand what are the intricacies and details of this particular discussion now this is important why because the gs2 has the salient features of representation of people's act which is concerning this case now before going deep into the topic let me first introduce you to the concept of electoral bond very briefly see if you are an individual if you are an hindu undivided family if you are a company a firm an association of persons or other person or agencies and you want to do better for the country you can do in one simple way that is you can fund the political parties that are going to take part in the elections because we understand that in any, any democracy elections are very important elections are the life blood of every democracy in the world and to fight these elections the electoral parties or the political parties need funds they need funds for campaigning they need funds for releasing manifestos right that is why they need funding at regular intervals so you as a company you as an individual can contribute to the nation by donating to the political party of your choice now in this way we can understand that individuals and various other people they contribute to the political parties through donations now electoral bond is just that simple thing it is just a way of donating your money to your political party of your choice now to illustrate this even better let me take the case of an uh, of a person right who is willing to donate around rupees 1000 to a political party a so one way that the person can do is donate to the uh, political party directly but this has an issue <clears throat> the issue is that this involves too much of cash transactions and you know that too much of cash transactions can spook the fear of say usage of black money in elections that is a very uh, you know unethical thing to do and that is why the government of india said that okay now all donations to uh, the political parties through electoral bonds will have to be done through digital media such as say upi transactions snet banking and any other digital mode or you can also issue a check to donate your 1000 rupees to your political party but how this process works see this process will work via this person going to some designated branches of state bank of india that are located in india itself and they will be asking the state bank of india to give an electoral bond or give a donation of around 1000 rupees 10000 rupees uh say around 1 lakh rupees 10 lakh rupees up to 1 crore rupees so any individual a company and anyone who are in this particular list they can donate up to 1 crore rupees to their political parties in this way and here this sbi will be giving this electoral bond to that person right and that person will be depositing this electoral bond to their political party of their choice and let me tell you this electoral bond do not have the name of the person on it that means if the person is giving this electoral bond of say 1000 rupees to a political party x this political party x do not know right the details of the donor 
that means the donor is completely anonymous here the biggest facet of this uh, electoral bond is first that it do not il involves any cash second the donors are completely anonymous only the sbi the state bank of india will have the details of the donors here now the political parties when they receive the bond they will be having 15 days till which they can encash the bonds and here let me tell you only registered political parties or those who have registered around 1% of the total vote share only they can uh, you know enroll for electoral bonds in india then these bonds will be available for purchase for around 10 days once the government says that okay we are going to release the electoral bonds right or say now the political parties are open to donations by electoral bonds the sbi will be opening this window for 10 days in months of january april july and october recently last month only the october bonds were released and in times of say lok sabha elections this can be stretched to 30 more days and in case of say uh, state assembly elections or say uh, union territories who have state legislative uh, assemblies they can have more uh, fortnight to claim these electoral bonds now these are the various features now the main debate that is going in the supreme court is regarding that anonymity clause now you know uh, elections need to be free and fair and above that in 2017 february budget session the then finance minister arun jaitley he told that free and fair elections are impossible without transparency in political funding that means who are contributing to what political party is very important for the citizens to know right because there are various stakeholders as we have seen right there can be individual persons there can be uh, various hindu undivided family business organizations there can be firms there can be corporate people so we can understand there are many different individuals who can uh, donate to political parties right it can be that the anonymous donations here right they ask they, they are raising many questions that why donors are seeking anonymity that means if a company is donating to a particular political party do the donors generally seek anonymity on their own because traditionally in india right since india became independent and also in all of the other countries it is a general trend that a company or a corporation or a private entity generally will be donating money to political party x to political party y and political party z it doesn't matter that if the political party x is ruling right now right if y is a rival of x so business organization people they have varied uh, you know uh, donation portfolio with reference to political parties so often traditionally corporations of uh, corporations in india it has been seen that they have donated money to both of the people to both ruling and uh, you know rival political parties it is not always the same that the donors may seek anonymity maybe questions are raised by various sections of the uh, intellectual class of the you know population right now that it is the government who is seeking anonymity because the government or say the various parties which are in power right now they do not want their donation to be disclosed publicly this can be one of the criticism that various quarters of the sex, uh, society are raising now the initial ob uh, objections when this electoral bond which was introduced in 2017-18 the initial uh, objections directly came from the regulators right the reserve bank of india they told that it can be opening a wide gamut of issues that if we are trying to anonymously uh, accept donations from the people for elections it can create hurdles for the various branches of the uh, state bank of india and the records of the transaction can be at peril and also the election commission of india in a letter to ministry of law it warned that it can lead or say electoral bonds it can lead to proliferation or say more growth of shell companies companies which do not have any base which do not have any you know physical presence mostly they, this can you know uh, increase and is, this can also increase the amount of black money in the political system because even companies 
uh, which do not have any uh, employees, do not have any profit uh, profitability, they can also donate to political parties via electoral bonds. Now, uh, the later uh, electoral uh, election commission of India later uh, had a U-turn regarding this. Then there are many other significant changes such as earlier there was a cap of 7.5% of donation of a particular company's property. That means that uh, you know up to uh, a 7.5% of company's uh, profits uh, a particular private company cannot donate to a particular political party. But this limit has been uplifted in this particular electoral bond and here this has been eliminated and also that a particular company can now donate up to 100% of their profits right then the foreign contributions which were earlier uh, earlier debated that they must not be allowed in Indian elections they are also right now allowed because there have been uh, many changes in our income tax act the FCRA right and also the RBI act to modify to amend these acts to allow the foreign contributions coming in India via electoral bond. Now this is also raising questions because the anonymous donations which may come from abroad they may not be disclosed to the public and also this will be promoting crony capitalism because crony capitalism essentially means that a very few big companies right conglomerates have very uh, high amount of connection networking with the government of the day right why because the government has lifted this uh, you know foreign contribution restriction it has lifted this amount of profit restrictions the companies can uh, you know uh, donate without any restrictions and let me tell you when companies donate or when companies give money to anyone they always have some intentions in mind right this can uh, help these companies get, uh, getting many favors from the government of the day and that is why the author of this article is asking aren't all these compromising the citizens right to know and when it comes to right to know we come across a very important or two very important supreme court uh, judgments the very first is the people's union for civil liberties or the very famous pucl case of 2003 and second we have the union of india versus the adr or association for democratic reforms the case of 2002 in which the supreme court has specifically said that the right to know by the citizens of their public officials these public officials are generally their elected authorities right this is a constitutional right under article 19 that is freedom of speech and expression right so it is a constitutional right the supreme court has clearly said that various details such as uh, you know the candidates who are fighting elections the, the the details of their assets the assets that they hold their criminal records their educational backgrounds everything right the citizens have the right to know so it has been clearly stated but here the attorney general recently has also said that Article 19 is not without reasonable restrictions, right? Attorney General of India is right now saying that the electoral bonds in India, right, can, is having a kind of a reasonable, uh, reasonable restriction if it is not uh, divulging the details of the anonymous donations. Generally, the government is telling that the cash is now eliminated, right? The cash the uses of cash in the economy uh, in this electoral bond is now eliminated every transactions can be counted individually uh, you know on a digital medium at the state bank of india if there are any defects the state bank of india can do it right but here the attorney general is telling that it is subjected to reasonable restrictions so here the way ahead uh, must be that the supreme court is still uh, you know deciding on the case it is a sub judice matter so it is expected that a supreme court can be taking a call on this matter very soon and beyond that uh, there are other solutions also that free and fair elections uh, you know test the integrity of our nation and that is why we can try to eliminate the amount of private funding because private funding always comes with their caveats so we can do away with that and we can introduce public funding for political parties 
This can be at the tune of 10,000 crore every five years based on the public donations only and the cumulative party collections as declared, right? The other way around can be uh, via this national election fund, which, uh, you know, by which the funds can be located to political parties based on their actual electoral performance. So these two reforms can be the way of the day, right? And also the Supreme Court can also decide on this uh, case that if there are donations, it can be made public, right? Because it is, you know, the citizen's right to, uh, you know, know under Article 19, right? It is a fundamental right of uh, Indian citizens. So the Supreme Court is likely to take a decision in this case. It is to be seen. And I encourage you all to just keep the track of this particular article. In the next article, we are going to discuss about the severe kind of pollution that is grappling the New Delhi uh, region right now in this particular time and in this case uh, as the, the entire city of New Delhi was enveloped in haze now haze is a particular environmental condition or say atmospheric condition where there are too much dust particles all around us right due to various pollutants right there are too much of particles around us particulate matter pollutants around us and the sunlight is being scattered or dispersed and that is why we cannot even see the clear sun due to heavy pollution, right? So this is the condition right now in Delhi. And that is why the private schools were totally shut down up to, uh, you know, November 6. And there is a ban on construction activity in New Delhi right now. Why this is important? Because in GS3, we have to study about the, you know, effects of environmental degradation. And also, there has been a, uh, you know, previous UPSC question uh, that came in GS3 that specifically asks why New Delhi is particularly vulnerable to air pollution other than cities such as Kolkata, Chennai, Mumbai. So that is why we need to focus on the pollution scenarios in New Delhi. Now see, directly going into the causes, we can understand that being the, you know, uh, capital of our country, New Delhi has a large number of, uh, you know, public and private vehicles. And let me tell you when there are a large number of vehicles, there is definitely going to be pollutants in the case of say particulate matter, right? Uh, nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides. Apart from that, there are also carbon monoxides, right? So these are the various pollutants which circulate the, uh, around the entire Delhi region due to large number of vehicles here. Now, second, there are also on the periphery of the NCR regions and also located within the NCR regions also, there are many industries. These industries, uh, you know, can be in the, uh, you know, tune of power plants, brick cans and chemical plants. This is severely polluting industries and they almost release the same kind of pollution such as vehicular emissions and also the NOx, the sulfur oxides, the volatile organic compounds, these all pollutants try, uh, you know, accumulate in this particular region. And particularly during winters, when the air is particularly dense, the air uh, also traps these pollutants and, you know, makes it very difficult for the pollutants to disperse to other regions also. Then there are construction activities, uh, being a city which is developing very fast, New Delhi, right? It is, uh, you know, uh, being seen that there is a growth of construction activities. And this construction activities due to uses of cement, sand, they release a lot of dust and pollution into the air. And these also lead to huge amount of air pollution and deteriorating air quality standards. Next, this is one issue that New Delhi has been facing since time immemorial. This is the case of stubble burning or biomass burning. What the farmers generally do after harvesting crops, they do what? They light fire to the crop residues because they think that it is of no use to them. But the states of Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, which surround New Delhi, they burn biomass. But they do not know that ultimately the, you know, the smoke, the dust that rises from the fire from their biomass essentially comes, uh, you know, accumulate in the uh, or above the New Delhi region. So this is a very serious issue. And this is one of the 
key reasons right now that is leading to this particular haze and this particular severe air quality you know deterioration as of now and this deterioration can be seen in this particular figure if we can see this is the overall ncr region and we can see the air quality levels have been uh, you know been ranging in the range of poor to very poor to very severe cases right so that is what we have to understand and also the very last uh, cause is about the geographical location of new delhi now if you see uh, we are you know in new delhi we are surrounded by uttar pradesh haryana and uh, punjab right and also rajasthan so here these are some of the adjoining and nearby neighborhood states so the stubble burning and the vehicular pollution there the the particulate matter they all come uh, you know in this particular region why because delhi if you can look at the topography of new delhi it is located in kind of a bowl like manner it is in a bowl shape manner so all the pollutants essentially pile up due to this bowl shape and this is also a very unique reason why uh, you know air pollution is much more severe than chennai than bombay than uh, you know kolkata right so this is uh, one of the most important reason here next we are uh, we have to look at the issue and before that we can look at some of the you know criteria for central pollution control boards air quality standards you can see that the uh, air quality index depends on the various you know figures that uh, we have here and in this category we can see the quality of the year now here the various issues uh, that impact the particular city of delhi and also uh, you know all across the world right the very first is health impact and when we are talking about issues we are talking about air pollution in general all across the world right not only in new delhi here the health impacts is very serious right because we i can understand we are taking in polluted air we are taking in nit uh, you know oxides of nitrogen oxides of sulfur oxides of carbon oxides of you know volatile organi organic uh, you know com uh, compounds so we are essentially inhaling a lot of pollutants and harmful hazardous chemicals this will be leading to respiratory problems generally in the case of children in the case of elderly they are the most vulnerable and they suffer uh, various respiratory diseases such as, uh, such as asthma then uh, you know since this pollutants essentially can also enter our blood stream many uh, people suffer from severe heart diseases you know according to some reports in new delhi if the pollution is very severe on in the category of very severe uh, category of air pollution it is as equal to smoking a pack of 10 cigarettes per day in a day uh, the pollution is very severe so we can understand that these can also lead to cancers in various cases such as even the lung, lung cancer and even in non smokers right so we can understand this issue is very severe then there are other issues such as premature death low birth weight and cognitive impairment of children so children are most likely to suffer from this then uh, coming to environmental challenge we can understand since the pollutants mix with the environment they go up high as the crowds and they mix with the clouds and mostly the uh, oxides of nitrogen and sulfur they mix with water and they come down to the land as acid rain and acid rain can be very corrosive to our monuments which are located to uh, the various vegetation which are located and this is very very uh, you know harmful next it leads to haze pollution particles when they interact with the sunlight they disperse the light and this can lead to a condition where people can see fog like condition all around uh, them uh, both in conditions of day and night and this is a very very dangerous situation and finally when we look at the economic impacts we can understand according to a study by ncaer the economic cost in delhi due to air pollution is 5.4% of the delhi city's gdp so these are some important facts and data that you can use in your main answers then also there is increased healthcare cost because obviously the, there are various health impacts and if people are being impacted by health so people have to spend out of their pockets on health expenditures and this can lead to economic impacts of people because there is a famous saying that goes that often the middle class people are 
a hospital bill away from poverty. So we can understand if people are being suffering from air pollution, their healthcare cost will be rising and their economic condition will deteriorate. Then there uh, is also a case of see, being seen reduced productivity because due to air pollution, due to various uh, you know issues of air pollution, people are generally not encouraged to step outside. So if people do not step outside, they do not they cannot go to work, right? So they will be less productive. And this will be leading to damage to power, you know, property, infrastructure and also the tourists who could have come in the Delhi winters, in the winters everywhere around the India, they will not come because they are particularly aware of these rising amounts of air pollution, uh, you know, in India. And Delhi is one of the most polluted cities when it comes to air all around the world. Now, some concluding thoughts uh, in this uh, manner can be some of the steps taken by the government over a particular period of years. Now, uh, recently, the Delhi Metro has said that it will be starting a 60 extra train trips. Why? Because it is now encouraging people to use more and more public transportation and reduce the amount of vehicular transport that they are doing right now. Then, there is this graded response action plan. If we can see here, this is having a stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 and stage 4. Each stage denotes the severity of air pollution. That means if the air quality is poor according to say Central Pollution Control Board's air quality standards index, if it is AQI is poor, it will be or say the Delhi, uh, you know, uh, pollution authorities, they will be designating this stage one of graded response action plan. If the air pollution is slipping into very poor um, quality, it will be going to stage two, then stage three and then stage four. And here, the main authority here is the CAQM, right? Uh, it is the Commission on Air Quality Management of the NCR region. This will be, this authority will be uh, setting up this graded, direction, uh, graded uh, you know, action plan where we are right now, the CAQM has right now enacted stage 3. Stage 3 means that immediately there will be ban on construction. There will be ban on certain kinds of vehicles of, you know, Bharat stage 4, right? So there will be this kind of things. And finally, when, you know, situation can be even more worse, it will be going into stage 4, right? So, it is now uh, going on to this manner and finally uh, the stubble burning issue is also there that is why the government has taken steps such as introducing the pusa bio decomposer which is essentially a very you know a drop of liquid which you can mix with water and you can pour that water over the crop residue and this will automatically decompose on the fields itself of the farmers right so we have to understand this is the in situ uh, you know, decomposition of the farmer's wastage uh, of this biomass. The ex situ, uh, you know, stubble burning issue can also be reduced by using those stubbles by generating, you know, power, such as using those stubbles uh, in coal thermal plants to generate more and more energy in that particular uh, region. So, this can also be done. And actually, the government is taking steps in this direction. Then, the government of Delhi has also introduced many electronic vehicles particularly the buses in New Delhi are, uh, you know, increasingly seeing the amount, uh, the adoption of electronic buses. Then, uh, according to Supreme Court ban, uh, Supreme Court regulations, uh, there is a cracker ban in New Delhi, which is being enforced very strictly. And finally, uh, you know, over the last month, the New Delhi government has announced a winter action plan. And this winter action plan is a very comprehensive plan to combat air pollution in India and also in this particular New Delhi region. So this is trying to combat through some governmental steps. And here we have to understand that this air pollution is an anthropogenic scene. So any political blame game that is taking place right now must be ignored, must not be taken up because this is a very serious issue right now. We need political collaboration, not political blame games. So it is a call to all of the political parties and of the political uh, leadership to take heed in this direction. And finally, 
the government of the day must also invest in research and development of new pollution control technologies so that we can go on to adopting more and more green resources and green energies. Now, this was all for this issue. Moving on to the next one. We find that this is an issue related to film piracy in India because recently the Information and Broadcasting Ministry has now provided an institutional mechanism to take action against film piracy. Now this is a very important uh, you know, development and this is a part of your GS2 governmental policies and interventions of government uh, schemes in various sectors. Now here. Before going into various details, let us understand what is film piracy at the very beginning. See, it is the illegal copying and distribution of films without the permission of the copyright holders. These copyright holders are generally the production houses, right? It can also be in case of directors and actors who are, uh, you know, making these films. We have to understand these films, right? Are the economic products of these production houses, uh, actors, and they value their films very close to their heart because it is their economic activity, it is their creativity that they do, it is the innovation that they present in the films and they work hard day and night and years and years uh, for the production of these films. And uh, what would you feel like if that particular films or if these films are pirated or sold free of cost or distributed free of cost to all of the people because these people have these producers, directors, actors, they have incurred a labor, they have incurred a cost of production of films, right? They do not want their films to be distributed free of cost. So uh, this is the issue that they are facing in cases of film piracy. And this can happen in a variety of ways, such as distributing uh, films freely or uploading freely on YouTube, Telegram channels, websites on online platforms, right? We now time and again see, right, in various Telegram channels, in WhatsApp, that there is this, uh, that there are these, uh, you know, film groups. So we are being aware that these are pirated films, which are being sold or distributed without the producers or, the, uh, you know, authorities. Then uh, there are also forms of downloading or streaming films from illegal websites. Then, uh, you know, piracy can also be in the form of buying or selling counterfeit DVDs or Blu-rays. And finally, it can also be in the form of recording films in cinemas or at home. So even if you are recording or screen recording a particular amount of, say, uh, film, that is also a kind of a piracy. Now here, let us look at the data. India is among the top five uh, countries in peer-to-peer -peer downloading of pirated films. Now, peer-to-peer -peer downloading may be familiar to some of you who are familiar with the word of torrent. Torrent is an online service which connects various online users to themselves, which is known as peer-to-peer. And they can sh essentially share the files among themselves if they are connected on that network. So the torrent service essentially works that if you have a particular pirated film and if you are in this network with 100 other people, so 100 other people can have access to your film and download on their own devices. So this is this uh, something known as peer-to-peer -peer downloading and this is completely illegal in all across the world. And Indians also make up the largest or the second largest group of people who are actually assessing this torrent websites such as Mininova, Torrents or the Pirate Bay. These are famous websites which are, uh, you know, dealing with illegal pirated copies of various software, you know, mobile games, PC games, movies. And why uh, you can say this piracy is happening at the very first place? It can be the case of say high ticket prices at various complex or say cine, uh, you know cinema multiplexes in India because the prices are typically very high in the range of 200, 300, 400 rupees which may be the middle class or say the lower class or the poorer classes of the people cannot afford. And it is also the case that in India right now we have cheap internet connectivity. Right? The data is very cheap in India right now. That is why people are downloading these films, you know, all of a sudden. That is the thing. But here, the government of India has taken a step. The very first step that they took was enacting a particular, uh, you know, act. That is known as the Cinematograph, uh, you know, uh, Amendment Act. 
this was actually enacted during the monsoon session and it is solving the issues regarding film certification and unauthorized recording and uh, exhibition of films and film piracy. So it is trying to take this step. Now the recent step that came from this ministry, Information and Broadcasting Ministry, they will be setting up 12 nodal officers in this Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. And these officers will also be posted at the Central Bureau of Film Certification. What they will do? They will be accepting complaints from the original copyright holder. For example, there is this film A, which the producers have found on various illegal websites. So the producers who are the original copyright holder or any other person, right, which the original copy, uh, copyright holder has given permission to, they can file a complaint with the nodal officers on online platforms, right? And these complaints can be lodged and action will be taken within 48 hours. The copyright holder will have to submit proof of ownership. Uh, you know, that particular film actually belongs to that copyright holder. And if there is no, uh, you know, uh, permission on this matter, then the nodal officer can hold hearings, look at the genuineness of the complaint and then they can, will be taking the action, right? Now here, the Cinematograph uh, Act is imposing stiff penalties. There are maximum jail term of around, uh, you know, three months and there can be a fine of three lakh rupees. The maximum uh, jail term, uh, you know, the, it can be up to three years. The minimum will be of three months and the fine will be 5% of the total audited gross production cost of the film. So the penalties are huge right now. So this is the case that was, you know, or say the step that was taken recently. Now here, the concluding thought is that, you know, for long, the Indian film industry demanded these steps. And this is actually fulfilling this big demand of, you know, film industry because they're losing crores and thousands of crores of rupees in pirated films. And also, you have to understand, Indian films are a soft power for India because many Indian films are very popular in other countries such as Germany, even China, US, other European countries, Latin American countries, the Middle East, you name it, Indian films are everywhere. Indian actors are almost everywhere. So India essentially sees the entertainment industry, the Bollywood, the, you know, the various film uh, industries in India as a soft power. So, India is very hell-bent on defending the industry's needs and aspirations. The industry needs to function properly and then only it can become a soft power. That is the thing. And further, the role is not, the job is not done right now. It is a very imperative need of the time to educate the people about the ill effects of piracy. Because it is the people, right, who are downloading this content on their smartphones, on their laptops and watching the films. So the people must be educated, the people must be aware of this particular development and the government must be doing this, government must be spreading this awareness. And this nodal officer should be working closely with the film industry and with the ISPs or the internet service providers to track the uploading and downloading of the films. And they, the Indian government should also be working with other uh, you know, countries to combat international film pirates because international film pirates are from countries such as Russia, such as China. So India must also deliberate on this particular case. Now, the next is about the Zika outbreak which you know uh, was found in a mosquito near Bengaluru and this is very important for prelims information because general science is one of the topics mentioned there. Now here, we need to look at the Zika virus and the various headers of say, how it gets transmitted, what are the symptoms and what are the complications finally, can it be treated. Beyond this, UPSC will not be asking about these particular diseases in these detailed manners. So let us look at this. Uh, the Zika uh, virus is actually a mosquito worn virus. It is uh, generally uh, been transmitted via these Aedes mosquitoes. And Aedes aegypti is also spreading diseases such as dengue, chikungunya. So it is the same mosquito that transmits this Zika virus. And the name Zika comes from the Zika forest of Uganda, which uh, the, the first of the samples were discovered in 1947. Now, they can spread uh, between humans via sexual contact, 
blood transfusion and also during the pregnancy of childbirth from where the virus can spread from mother to children. The symptoms uh, in this particular disease are mainly asymptomatic but here we can see uh, the people can have some mild symptoms such as headache, conjunctivitis, fever, muscle pain, skin rash and joint pain. So these are some uh, common symptoms that they face. Now uh, the main complications that the virus uh, victims face are you know small uh, you know infants because they face microencephaly or a condition when uh, where the uh, head or the size of the head of children are very smaller in respect to the other children of the same age and same gender. So this is a, a kind of a birth defect. Another kind of defect is also uh, you know Gullian Barr syndrome which is an autoimmune uh, disorder that can lead to muscle weaken weakness and paralysis in children also. So generally the complications are faced by children <clears throat> and typically the infants and here the treatment is not available uh, of any kind there is no vaccine but uh, you know when uh, a particular Zika outbreak outbreaks uh, it is very important that doctors must be on the field right medications uh, must be there people must be people are generally advised to take more rest and drinking more water right and generally the same things that uh, you know are advised for preventing malaria and dengue they are actually uh, you know uh, recommended to prevent zika virus such as say using insect repellents covering bed using mosquito nets wearing uh, long sleeve shirts so the mosquitoes uh, cannot bite uh, the particular victims now the next article is about india services pmi because the according to the latest purchasing managers index services growth has lost steam in october now while month to month comparisons are not that much of important for examination but we must know the current pulse of the economy and also we must know what is PMI because in prelims we have economic and social development as a topic. Now see when it comes to purchasing managers index it is a private it is a private index that means it is not being issued by a government authority. It is being issued by various private organizations and here this recent index is issued by Standard and Poor. Right? Here this PMI are derived from surveys. These surveys are actually the questionnaires that some of the managers of companies which are involved in manufacturing, services, construction, they are uh, you know uh, ask some questions. Their questions are generally in the form of say orders. Say they are asked that please indicate how the level of new orders for your products have changed since the last month. So they are given three options. Has they increased or have they unchanged or, 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 or have they decreased over a period of time. If they say that they have increased. So this PMI is using 50 as the base value. This means that 50 here is the base value if they say they, the orders have increased over the last month. That means it is increasing, PMI is increasing. If say the order is unchanged, it will be on this 50 line. If they say the order have decreased, it will be decreasing. Now why this is important? Because if according to companies managers in construction sectors, in service sectors, in manufacturing sectors, if their orders have increased, that means their economic production or activity have increased, right? So this means that overall the industries are performing better, the GDP is growing well. So that is why PMI is often compared to the GDP because they're, uh, you know, calculating the, you know, uh, output of manufacturing services and construction center sectors here. Now, if we take the examples uh, here, the manufacturing service and construction sector, generally, uh, if you take the example of manufacturing sector, the purchasing managers uh, or the managers are generally asked on questions such as new orders, output, employment, supply delivery uh, times, stock of purchases or inventories or say they ask the managers, are you receiving new orders or are you having more output over the last month? 
did you hire new people over the last month or did you meet the service delivery timelines did you meet the deadlines so these are the questions that they ask in this format and whatever they reply right they are calculated in this index this index is pmi equal to p1 p1 means the percentage of survey uh, you know or the percentage of managers who are saying that there is an improvement that they have seen that sales have increased orders have increased so this will be taken as an index as p1 p2 are the people who said that there is unchanged and p3 are the people who said that the orders or say all of the parameters have decreased over a period of time now if we can understand if the pmi is above 50 that means there is an increasing sense of economic activity right if it is decreasing then the economy is contracting because the managers are now, not now getting more orders they are not employing more so above 50 is good for the economy above below 50 is bad for the economy and let me tell you above 50 means that the rate of say new orders output employment they are all increasing right they are, these are the rates of increase of this particular authority then the advantage of uh, over gdp using pmi is that gdp is generally calculated in a quarterly manner right over three months four months but here this is released on a monthly basis and even it is so accurate that even the bank of england sets its policy rates such as the reserve bank of india sets the repo rates right the bank of england they set their policy rates on the basis uh, or say taking some uh, you know cues from the pmi now here let us see uh, about the india services pmi it is being seen that the services over the last month pmi has been decreasing why because we have to understand this pmi uh, you know uh, when it is we are talking about pmi of this line of 50 over this line of 50 we can understand this growth or the rate of growth has decreased while the services is still increasing in india because above 50 means the orders the employments are increasing but the rate of growth has reduced why because new businesses are not now growing at that uh, high pace as of now right this is one of the reason because since may the new businesses or say also the startups the msmes are not growing at that pace which was seen in may then the new jobs are not been created employment is not been created at a very fast growth and finally inflation which prevailed in india over the months of say april may june right high prices of food fuel and stuff cost the conflicts which are going internationally such as the russia ukraine crisis the recent crisis of say uh, israel palestine uh, issue which is going on right these are all impacting these services and this is why the rate of growth of india's pmi has slowed down so this was all uh, for today i thank you all for being a very patient audience till we meet again soon study to your best level thank you